Good morning, and once again, welcome. This lesson is being recorded for Sunday, November the 14th, 2021. This is the lesson that will be presented when we uh, assemble at 10.50 a.m. here in Bellflower to worship God. And certainly, and as always is the case, if you are in the area, we invite you to come be with us as we worship God. Uh, this morning, I ask you, if you will, to turn your Bibles to John chapter 14, where we are continuing our theme of the teachings of Jesus, uh, which was our theme for 2020 and 2021. And we are actually coming toward the end of this particular study. We just have a few more lessons that we are going to be examining. And you may recall in our last lesson we actually dealt with um, Matthew chapter 23. And what you find there is, uh, um, in that particular lesson, uh, we find that Jesus presented a lesson that, that was what I describe as the straw that broke the camel's back. Because uh, um, he had been uh, very, very strongly condemning them and letting them know that God was going to be judging the religious leaders. The, so as a result of that, the stage has been set for the crucifixion of Jesus. As a matter of fact, uh, Judas Iscariot has already been bribed as this occasion takes place here. And, uh, and so he's going to betray Jesus. Now, this lesson that we're going to be talking about this evening, likely it was presented uh, when they were gathered together to partake of the Lord's Supper as recorded in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And some of the things that we find taking place on that occasion is that Jesus had demonstrated the importance of serving one another by washing the disciples' feet. You find that recorded in John chapter 13, uh, which we do not have time to deal with uh, uh, either in this lesson or in our studies uh, at this time. Uh, but we find that Jesus was uh, teaching about the importance of service. Furthermore, he has indicated his betrayal, that he was going to be betrayed and that he was not only going to be betrayed, but also that he was going to be abandoned by his disciples and so on. And you find in John 13 that Jesus talks a little bit about what was going to happen with that betrayal and the fact that Peter was going to deny him. And of course, this leads to the, the discourse that we want to talk about today in John chapters 14 through 16. Now, my goal is to get through this entire text in this lesson. And of course, that means that we're not going to be reading the entire text, and I'm not going to be talking about everything that is in here. As a matter of fact, uh, an, an extensive amount of time could be devoted to these chapters, as there's a whole lot of good material to give consideration to, as is with anything that Jesus teaches. But what we want to do this in this particular lesson is we want to notice a few themes that are found throughout this particular message that Jesus is presenting in what I describe as his farewell message. He's preparing them once and for all for the fact that he's about to die. And he wants them to have some comfort and some assurance as that takes place. And so we're going to talk about four different concepts in this particular lesson. And the first one, we're just going to briefly go over it because it's things we've talked about before. And that is the concept of access to the Father. The way that Jesus begins this lesson is by talking about, in my Father's house are many mansions. If I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again. Now, we've already talked about that text earlier this year, where we noted in the I am sayings of Jesus in John 14 and verse 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. So Jesus points to the fact that he is going to be the access for them and for all to the Father. And, and that's an important thing to understand about who Jesus is. And throughout this, um, throughout this teaching here, he reminds them of the, the importance of that fact. As a matter of fact, he makes the point to them that, that he has declared the Father to them. They're actually asking him questions uh, to a degree as to exactly who he was. And he, he makes the point that I've been with you, and therefore I have revealed the Father to you. 
And that's some of the things that he deals with in verses 9 and 10 of John chapter 14. And further on in the chapter after that, he notes that the works that he has done in their midst they, they have established who he was, and, and uh, the apostles have already declared who Jesus is. They know that he is the promised Messiah that they are looking for. And Jesus notes that when I leave, you're going to do greater works than I have done. And of course, we find that to be fulfilled as you go through um, the book of Acts, and you find some of the things that they actually did. So those are some of the points that Jesus makes as he as he talks about access to the Father and how he was going to be with them. You find furthermore in chapter 15 and beginning in verse number 14 of that text that Jesus says to them that you are my friends. You are not simply servants, but you are my friends. And they had been chosen to do the work that needed to be done. And so that's one of the observations that he makes there. And, of course, he points out that they were loved because of the way that they loved him in John chapter 16 and in verse number 27. Now, this is one of the, uh, one of the points that we can learn, and we could spend a whole lot more talking about this, the relationship of, uh, of Jesus to his apostles and their access to the Father because of him. But I want to notice a couple of other important uh, key elements that Jesus emphasizes over and over. And one of those elements is the need for love. Now we've talked about in times past in lessons about the importance of love. As a matter of fact, it's one of those, it's one of those foundational um, um, uh, principles that we need to understand and we need to strive to develop in our lives. Jesus, in, in Matthew 22, when asked what is the greatest commandment, he said that it is, number one, to love God with all your heart, your soul, and your mind. And, and the second is like it. Uh, love your neighbor as yourself. And then in verse 40 of Matthew 22, Jesus would say, on these two commands hang all the law and the prophets. Certainly the importance of love was something that was emphasized and something that needed to be understood by them, and it needs to be understood by us. In 1 Corinthians chapter 13, where Paul describes a more excellent way than, than the ways of even spiritual gifts, he talks about the way of love. And he talks about in verse number 1, though I, have, uh, um, uh, though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, uh, but have not love, I am as sounding brass or a clanging cymbal. To God, if I don't have love, it doesn't matter what I say. It is noise to him. And no matter what good works I do, if I don't have love, it is noise to him. If you study the New Testament, you will learn that, it, that love is fundamental in every relationship we are involved in as Christians. Whether you're talking about your relationship with God and Jesus and Spirit, or their relationship with you, it's a, a relationship based upon Christian love. Our relationship for our brethren, our relationship for uh, even one another, uh, our husbands and wives and within our families, our relationship with our neighbors, even our relationship with our enemies involves the importance of love. So love is a subject that needs to, we need to be continually reminded about. And it was something that was foundational in this message that Jesus is teaching to his disciples. So let's notice a few passages where Jesus talked about love as he was speaking to his uh, apostles on this occasion. And we actually go back to John chapter 13, and this is after he washes the disciples' feet, and it's still on this occasion. And he says to them in John 13, verses 34 and 35, A new commandment I give you, that you love one another, as I have loved you, that you also love one another. By this all will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. Jesus talks about this new commandment, and it's actually something that they had learned before, 
but it was new from the standpoint of the way that it was going to be applied. And, and as a part of this new law, they needed to love each other in the same way that he had loved them. And Jesus goes on and says, by this all will know you are my disciples. And one of the points that I have made before from this verse is that the world is watching us to see how we treat each other as brethren. Do we love each other the way that we claim to? And in reality, he says in this verse that the world has the right to judge us by the way that we love each other. Well, let's move on in our text and go over to John chapter 14. And in verse number 15, and we find here in this text that Jesus says, If you love me, keep my commandments. I think an important aspect that we need to understand about true Christian love is it's not uh, the way the word is used in our society today. It's something that involves submission. It's something that involves an action, a response. And the, our love for God is demonstrated by doing what he tells us to do. And Jesus says the same thing about him. If you love me, you're going to do what I tell you to do. And that would become a major theme in the teachings of, uh, uh, in the teachings of John in his letters. You go over to 1 John chapter 4. In 1 John chapter 4, and in verse number 19... And you read there in that text, it says, We love him because he first loved us. When we understand the depth of God's love for us, it ought to prompt us to love him. And if we do that, we're going to do what he says. In 1 John chapter 5 and in verse 3, you read there, For this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not burdensome. Now understand in that text, John is not saying that keeping the commandments of God is always easy. But the point is, is if you have the love that you ought to, you're willing to do those things. And, and they're not going to be a weariness. Uh, they're not going to be burdensome. You're going to be willing to do the things that God ha wants you to do. And it's because you love God the way that you ought to love him. So that's one of the points that Jesus makes to his disciples. You're going to do what I say if you love me. And he's, and he's basically saying you are going to because you do love me. But we continue in our text. Going to John chapter 15. And in verse number 21 it is further emphasized where he says, But all these things they will do to you for my sake um, uh, because they do not know him who sent me. Um, John uh, 14 and in verse uh, 21. Uh, he who has my commandments and keeps them, it is he who loves me. And he who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I will love him and manifest myself to him. Judas, not Iscariot, said to him, Lord, how is it that you will manifest yourself to us? and not to the world. Jesus answered, If anyone loves me, he will keep my word, and my Father will love him, and we will come to him and make our home with him. So we find here in John 14, verses 21 through 24, that Jesus further emphasizes the importance of obeying God based upon our love. But in this text, you also note that he says there that if we love him and in that love we do the things that he tells us to do, that the Father will love us and come and make his home with us. Now that love that we're talking about there, it's not simply the love of the world, or the way that God so loves everyone in the world, but he does, John 3.16. But this is talking about that familial love, that relationship that those who are a part of him have. You know, we are reminded that, that we are a part of his family. We have an inheritance because of this love for us. So Jesus emphasizes again in this text the importance of keeping his commandments as we love him. Now let's turn over to John chapter 15. And in John chapter 15 and in verse number 9, Jesus says, As the Father loved me, I also have loved you. Abide in my love. And that's an emphasis that Jesus 
demonstrates the love of the Father in the way that he loved them. And so we can learn about how God loves us by looking at the love of Jesus for us and those who were his disciples. Then in verse 10, he says, if you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love. And there we hear that again. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my father's commandments and abide in his love. And what we find in this text here is Jesus is emphasizing that he loved the father and demonstrated his love by keeping his commandments. And the point is, is that Jesus was willing to go through what he needed to do for us. And he did that out of love for the Father. That's why when he was in the garden praying, if it be not your will, or if it be your will, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but your will be done. Jesus submitted to the Father, giving us an example of submitting to the Father. And, and you find over in 1 Peter 2 and verse 22 that he is our example in everything. He committed no sin, but nevertheless, he sets an example for us that we should walk in his steps in everything that we do. Just as, as he loved the Father and kept his commandments, so we need to love the Father and keep his commandments. And furthermore, we find in that verse, in verse number 10, he makes the point there that if you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love. And the point that I would emphasize there by the idea of abiding in his love is that it's going to be something that's continuing in our lives. It's going to be a part of who we are. This isn't going to be a, an on and off thing. This isn't going to be, you know, a, a one-time act or something that you occasionally do. You're going to be dwelling in his love. And he is going to be uh, in your, uh, and your love is going to be uh, directed toward him throughout your life. Well, we continue in that text. And we find here in verse 12, this is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this than to lay down one's life for his friends. Here we find the fact that Jesus showed his love for us by willing to die for us. That's the depth to which Jesus demonstrated his love for us. Now, are we willing to have that type of a love toward one another. How much do we love one another as brethren? Over in 1 John chapter 3 and in verse number 16. 1 John chapter 3 and in verse number 16, we read there in that text, by this we know love, because he laid down his life for us, and we also ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. What are we willing to do for one another as brethren? We look at the example of Jesus and all that he did for us. And that ought to prompt us in the way that we treat one another as brethren. In 1 John 4 and verse 11, uh, John there said, Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. Looking to the degree to which God has loved us. Do we love each other to the best of our ability to that degree? And so we find all of these admonitions for love in our text. And that's a major theme that we need to give consideration to as we look at this particular text. But let's also notice another key doctrine or a key theme that is emphasized as Jesus is speaking to these brethren in his farewell address. And that is concerning the helper. And when we talk about the helper, what we mean there is the Holy Spirit. And as if you want to understand the working of the Holy Spirit and what we glean from him, I encourage you to read John 14 through 16, just looking at the Holy Spirit and what you read about that. Uh, and I'll tell you right now that I don't understand everything about the working of the Holy Spirit, uh, even back then. Uh, and what all he does today, I do not fully understand. But I know this, that if, if I want to understand how he influences us, a lot of that is found in the text that we are 
dealing with. And that has to do with the revealing of God's will to us through the apostles. And that's really the point that is continually emphasized in this uh, 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 address of Jesus to his apostles on this occasion. You see, without the Holy Spirit, we could not and would not fully understand God. And that's one of the points that Paul made over in 1 Corinthians 2, where, where uh, uh, the only reason we know anything about the mind of God is because he has revealed it to us through his spirit. And friends, I want you to understand this. As far as we are concerned, we cannot separate the working of the Holy Spirit from the word that he has revealed to us. In other words, he's not going to come down to us with some special revelation and whisper in our ears, you know, something that's different than what God's word says. Well, he's not going to whisper in our ears that way anyways. Uh, the fact is, is we have God's message revealed to us. And that's the work of the Holy Spirit. Let's look at some of the things that Jesus said in this farewell address concerning the Holy Spirit. And we begin with John chapter 14. And going back to John 14 and in verse number 16, we read there, and I want you to note verse 15, we talked about this. If you love me, you will keep my commandments. So we find that the helper is going to be sent based upon submitting to God. Uh, he was going to be sent to them because they were doing what he wanted them to do. And Jesus says to his apostles, if you love me, keep my commandments, and I will pray the Father. And he will give you another helper that he may abide with you forever. The spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him. But you know him for he dwells with you and, uh, and will be in you. I will not leave you orphans. I will come to you. Here we find that Jesus makes the point that because of your submission to me and your willingness to do what I would have you to do. I'm going to send you another helper. Even though I am going away, even though I am leaving, I'm not going to leave you without help. He says, he says there, uh, I'm going to pray the Father and he's going to give you another helper. And I think some versions use the word comforter here. And this is dealing with the idea of the word that is user is somebody that stands beside you. And he is there with you. And that is certainly a, a, a great description of the Holy Spirit and how he works with us. So you have that idea of a helper or a comforter. And I'm going to tell you right now, we need the Holy Spirit in our lives. We need him to lead us. And I understand that that's something that's misunderstood by many. There are many who expect a miraculous leading of the Holy Spirit. And, and we read in the New Testament that he does not direct us that way. He does not direct us in the same way that he directed the apostles in the first century. But nevertheless, we still need to be read, led by him. Romans chapter 8, that's the, 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 the main point that Paul's making in that text. We need to be led by the Spirit. And we need to understand that he is there and he is active. And among the things that we know that he does for us is he intercedes on our behalf, as we read about over in Romans chapter 8 and in verse number 26. But the point that we find in our text here is Jesus is going to send a helper and he describes him as the spirit of truth. That's the point that Jesus is making and what we need to understand about what John is writing about the teaching on this occasion. He is uh, he's the one who is going to reveal the truth to them, and they in turn would reveal the truth to us. And Jesus makes that promise there in verse 18, I will not leave you orphans. I'm not going to leave you alone. You're going to know what you need to do even after I am gone. And it is because the Holy Spirit is going to be there to direct you in these matters. Well, let's uh, you know, uh, proceed in our text in, in John chapter 14, verses 25 and 26. These things I have spoken to you while being present with you. But the helper, 
the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I said to you. And so here we find the emphasis of what the Holy Spirit is going to do. He's going to remind you of the things that I have taught, and he's going to bring to your remembrance all things that you need. And so we need to understand about that. And Jesus will further develop this as, as we go on in his teachings. He continues to encourage them in various ways. And then we find in John chapter 15 and in verse 26, he says there, But, the, but when the Helper comes, whom I shall send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth, who proceeds from the Father, he will testify of me, and you also will bear, will bear witness because you have been with me from the beginning. So the point is, is the Holy Spirit, the helper when he comes, uh, who, whom I'm going to send from the Father, he's going to come from God is the point that is made there. And again, he's described as the spirit of truth. He said he will testify of me. So we find here that the Spirit's going to bear witness of Jesus. So even though Jesus is no longer going to be with them, the Holy Spirit is, is going to help in establishing who Jesus is and help them to understand that and help them to reveal that to others. Uh, you may remember that uh, 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 a few weeks ago we dealt with Matthew chapter 10 in, in two, la two or three lessons dealing with a limited commission. And among the things that we noted in that text is Jesus said that you're going to be brought before, before kings and before governors. And don't be concerned about what you're going to say. It will be told you at that occasion. The Holy Spirit was going to be with them and help them to be able to reveal God's message to them and ultimately to us. I also think about miracles. You know, you may recall how in John 5 and verse 36, Jesus talking about himself, even if you don't believe me, even if you don't like me, look at the works that I do. They bear witness of whom I am. And, and the apostles would continue, would continue to do the works of the Holy Spirit, as in they would be performing miracles of all different types. They would even be given the ability to lay their hands on others so that they could receive the Holy Spirit. And in that way, the Holy Spirit would be confirming Jesus through the apostles because that's who they were going to be teaching. Over in Hebrews chapter 2, <laughs> Hebrews chapter 2 and in verse number 4, the Hebrew writer says there as he's encouraging uh, uh, the brethren there not to give up. He says there, for he has spoken in a, 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 a he has spoken in a, or a, a certain time, or a Hebrew, I'm in the wrong chapter there, in Hebrews 2, and in verse 4, God also bearing witness, both with signs and wonders, with various miracles and gifts of the Holy Spirit, according to his own will. God has bore witness to us through the, the gifts of the Holy Spirit. Miracles verified their teachings about Jesus. Truly, they were not alone. And that's the promise that is given to them as we turn back to our text and the promise that Jesus makes to them. But he's not done dealing with the Holy Spirit. We continue and we come to verse number 7. And Jesus here makes the point, Nevertheless, I tell you the truth, it is to your advantage that I go away. They don't want him to leave. They're sorrowing because he says, I have to leave you. But Jesus saying, it's to your advantage. Why? He says, for if I do not go away, the helper will not come to you. But if I depart, I will send him to you. And when he comes, and when he has come, he will convict the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. Of sin because they do not believe in me. Of righteousness because I go to the Father and you see me no more. Of judgment because the ruler of this world is judged. So we find here that Jesus says it is to your advantage that I go away. Because if I don't go away, the helper will not come. Now, now, now you might ask the question, why was it an advantage 
for Jesus to go away. And I can think of many reasons, and I just want to list three of them right here. Number one, they wanted a physical kingdom. They, they never could get that out of their mind, even while Jesus was on this earth. And certainly that's what the Jews wanted. You remember in Acts chapter 1 and in verse number 6, where, where as Jesus is about to ascend to heaven, uh, they ask him, are you going to restore the kingdom to us at this time? Jesus says, you know what, wait. You go into Jerusalem and wait, and you will be endued with the Holy Spirit. But remember that Jesus before Pilate emphasized, my kingdom is a spiritual kingdom. It is not of this world. It never has been and never will be. And so that's the point that Jesus is emphasizing. They wanted a physical kingdom. As long as Jesus was on the earth, that's what they were expecting. So by Jesus ascending to heaven, they would understand the nature of the kingdom of God. Where Jesus is now reigning in heaven, seated by the, at the right hand of God, he is now our king. He is now our Lord. And we understand that because of the work of the Spirit, because Jesus has left. Furthermore, while he is in heaven, seated at the right hand of God, he is there to make intercession for us. 1 John 2, 1 describes him as an advocate when we sin. Hebrews 7 and verse 25 talks about how he does live to make intercession for us. Uh, Hebrews 4 talks about how he understands because he was one of us. He came in human flesh, and, and therefore he knows what we are going through. All of these things are true because Jesus left the earth and went to heaven. But he did not leave us or them alone. He did not leave them alone because he sent to them the helper, the Holy Spirit. And he said when he comes, this is what he's going to do. He is going to convict the world. The Holy Spirit, through uh, that which he revealed through the apostles, would change the world once and forever. For the remainder of the existence of this world, Jesus Christ is going to reign supreme. And he will convict people. You know, I'm reminded of the preaching of Peter on the day of Pentecost after the Holy Spirit fell on them in Acts chapter 2 verses 1 through 4. They were baptized with the Holy Spirit and he preaches this sermon and, and when he gets done it says they were cut to the heart. Where the idea is they were convicted by the teachings of the apostles being led by the Holy Spirit. Now notice how he said in this text that he will convict the world number one of sin and, and it goes on, it says in verse 9, because they do not believe in me. And the point that you would consider in that is, is that the, the Holy Spirit will expose what sin actually is. And it will expose those who are believers and those who are not believers. And the bottom line is, because people rejected Jesus, they will have no excuse. You know, uh, uh, and uh, and uh, uh, those who do not believe are not going to be able to stand before God and say, we didn't understand. They have opportunity. So the Holy Spirit is going to identify what sin is, and he's going to expose sin by teaching what righteousness is. And the idea of righteousness is the opposite of sin in this sense. So sin is that which is contrary to the will of God. Righteousness is submitting to the will of God. And it's interesting how our text says in verse 10, he will convict the world of righteousness because I go to my Father and you see me no more. And the point is, is Jesus is going to ascend to heaven. But before he does that, he's going to be crucified and he's going to be raised from the dead. And being raised from the dead, you're going to find in that uh, the demonstration of the righteousness of God and his righteousness while he was on earth. His claims were true and righteous. You know, I, I, I'm reminded of the Sermon on the Mount. Uh, the whole premise of the Sermon on the Mount was righteousness 
and exceeding righteousness, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. Jesus taught in Matthew chapter 5, about verses 19 and 20 there. Or, or look at the book of Romans. All throughout the Romans, it deals with the righteousness of God. You want to understand the righteousness of God? Read the book of Romans, or study the book of Romans. It's not an easy read, but if you study it, you'll understand righteousness. And that was revealed by Paul through the Holy Spirit. So he convicts the world of righteousness. We understand how to be righteous with God. It has nothing to do with our merit. But nevertheless, he convicts the world of righteousness. So he leads some to Christ, and he convicts those who reject Christ. But it also says that he will convict the world of judgment. And in verse 11, you read it because the ruler of this world is judged. And the point is, uh, the, the, the point is, is Christ is greater than the one who is in the world, and the world is going to be judged. All men are going to stand in judgment for righteousness and sin. And the question is, where are you going to stand when that judgment takes place? And incidentally, if, if you want to know uh, the standard by which you're going to be judged, it's the teachings of the Holy Spirit. The teachings of Jesus, which uh, the Holy Spirit was reminding them of over in John 12 and in verse number 48, Jesus said, the words that I have spoken will judge you in the last day. In Revelation 20 and verse 12, you read there uh, a, a picture of the judgment scene. It says books were opened and people were judged by the, the things that were in those books. So we find that we're going to stand before God in judgment. And those who have not obeyed the gospel are going to be condemned by God. So the work of the Spirit in revealing God's word is one that will convict the world of sin, righteousness, and judgment. Well, let's keep going. We find in John 16, verses 13 through 15, Jesus says in verse 12, I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. However, when he, the spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth. For he will not speak of his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak. And he will tell you things to come. He will glorify me, for he will take of what is mine and declare it to you. All things that the Father has are mine. Therefore, I said that he will take of mine and declare it to you. Now, what we find in this particular text here is a continuation, another reminder that when he comes, he's going to guide you into all truth. You may remember in John 14, it said, he will bring to your remembrance all things that I've said. Well, here the emphasis goes further. He will guide you into all truth. He'll tell you everything that you need. And in the process, Jesus will be glorified. And you need to understand that through the Holy Spirit, the apostles had a better understanding of Jesus and his work. You know, it's interesting that while they followed him on earth, they did not have a complete understanding of who Jesus was. Oh, they knew that he was the promised Messiah and so on. But you read over in John 24 and verse 45, this is after Jesus was raised from the dead. It tells us there that he opened their understanding. To where they would understand more. And, and then you, uh, you know, and, and we understand Jesus better because of the teachings of the apostles. They were, uh, they were guided into all truth by the Holy Spirit. And they revealed that to us. Therefore, we have an understanding of all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him through the knowledge of our Lord, which was revealed by the Holy Spirit. So we understand Jesus better because of the teachings of the apostles. And all of that was, uh, uh, was emphasized to the apostles. Now, they didn't fully understand it even then, but they would. So what are some lessons that we can learn from talking about the Helper as taught in this lesson? Well, number one, I want you to understand that these verses 
were directed primarily to the apostles. I don't want you to forget that. We do not receive revelation the way, today the way that they do. And I know there are many out there that claim that God speaks to them and tells them this or that. Friends, they're false teachers. God's word emphasizes that. But the apostles, the, the Holy Spirit directed them in what to write and in what to teach. That's why Paul would say in 2 Timothy 3 and verse 16, all scripture inspired of God is profitable. It is breathed by God. Over in Acts chapter 1 and verse 4 that we talked about a few moments ago, the apostles would ask him, are you going to restore the kingdom at this time? And Jesus said, just wait. Go to Jerusalem and wait, and you'll know. You, uh, you will be endued with power. And in Acts chapter 2, you read about that power. And friends, they then understood. They had a greater understanding and an understanding of everything that they needed to say so that they could teach the truth of God's word. So that's the first thing to understand is we don't have the Spirit the same way that the apostles did. But another thing that we just need to remind ourselves of is that the New Testament is the product of the work of the apostles who were guided by the Holy Spirit. And there's actually a number of different passages uh, that emphasize these things. Earlier on, on we, we, we talked about Matthew 10, 18. Uh, you'll be told what you need to say. You know, I'm reminded of Galatians 1 where Paul said there, My gospel didn't come from men. It came through the revelation of Jesus Christ. Ephesians 3, 3 and 4. Uh, by revelation it has been made known to me the mystery. 2 Peter 1, 19 through 21. You read there in that text, uh, uh, about prophecy of Scripture. And it says there, uh, verse 20, or verse 19, So we have the prophetic word confirmed, which you do well to heed as a light that shines in a dark place, until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts, knowing this first, that no prophecy of Scripture is of any private interpretation, for prophecy never came by the will of men, but holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. Spirit. They did the teaching. The Holy Spirit worked through the prophets, through the apostles, and through others who had received uh, um, who had received the Spirit in the first century, uh, so that they could reveal the Word of God. And and, and they're the ones that re, that wrote it down and revealed it. We simply benefit from their work. And that's something that we must remember. That's a great lesson for us to consider when we talk about the help, helper. Friends, I want you to understand, never, ever, ever underestimate the power of the gospel. Because of what the Holy Spirit has done. It is God's word, and it is all that we need. Romans 1 and verse 16 tells us it is the power of God unto salvation. Hebrews 4 and verse 12 tells us the word of God is living and, 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 and powerful or living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of, of, of uh, joints and marrows, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. The word of God is living and powerful. Even 2,000 years later, it still convicts souls. That's what makes it so powerful. So we are so grateful because of the work of the apostles. And Jesus promised to send the helper. And he did. Aren't you grateful that he did? Well, that leads us to one final lesson. that I, I And I just want to briefly mention this. I wish we had time to develop it more, but we don't. But one of the points that we find in... Uh, this uh, uh, farewell admonition of Jesus is he knew what the apostles were about to face. And so throughout his teachings here, he continued to encourage them over and over. In John chapter 15 and beginning in about verse number 18, he notes there that uh, uh, the world's going to hate you. 
because of what you're going to take, teach. If the world hates you, know that it hated me before it hated you. That's one of the points Jesus makes is you're not alone. They've despised me. So as my apostles, as my representatives, they're going to hate you as well. And they're going to do things to, to try and persecute you. But he's going to point out that they are of the world, but you are not of the world, Jesus would emphasize in verse 19. If you were of the world, the world would love its own. Yet because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. And I'm going to talk more about that in my lesson next week, dealing with the prayer of Jesus in John 17. So we find that he said, you're not of the world. But he goes, but he goes on and he makes the point that um, that they they needed to understand in their work they were not greater than Jesus who himself had uh, suffered persecutions and rejection and was about to go through something that was extremely worse the crucifixion and Jesus makes the point that you're not greater than your master there you know verse twenty a servant's not greater than his master if they persecuted uh, if if they persecuted me. They will also persecute you. If they kept my word, they will keep yours. And incidentally, there's some comfort there. Jesus is saying, not everybody's going to persecute you. Some are going to listen because of what you're going to say. And he goes on and talks about the fact that, that the world is going to be judged because Jesus came. They're not going to have an excuse. And that's one of the points that Jesus emphasizes they are uh, they're without excuse because I've revealed the message to them. You know, they might have something to say if I hadn't told them what they needed to do, but they've heard it. So they have no excuse. You know, Paul said the same thing over in Romans 1 and verse 20. When you look at the world and then you turn around and deny that there is a God. What kind of excuse are you going to make when you stand before God in judgment? And kind of interesting, uh, James 4, 17. Think about it in this light. You know, that, that says, therefore, to him who knows to do good and does not do it, to him it is sin. You know, think about that from the standpoint of, uh, of standing before God in judgment. You know you need to respond to God, but you don't. Don't let that be you. Well, Jesus will go on in the lesson, and in John 16 and in verse 1, these things I have spoken to you that you should not be made to stumble. This is designed to build you up. I'm telling you these things so that you'll remember them when they happen. And we need to understand that, uh, th that with his word, it can keep us from following. Acts 20 and verse 32. Uh, verse 32, Paul speaking to the Ephesian elders. I commend you to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up. God will make the way of escape. 1 Corinthians 10 verse 13, uh, where temptations are concerned. And you find an example of that in Jesus as he dealt with temptations with Satan in Matthew 4. It is written was the answer. So as we learn the word of God, it builds us up. And it keeps us, and it can keep us from stumbling. But only if we do what it says. Verses 2 and 3 of John 16. They will put you out of the synagogue. Yes, um, the, the time is coming that whoever kills you will think that he offers God service. And these things they will do to you because they have not known the Father nor me. But these things I have told you that when the time comes you may remember that I told you of them. So he continues to encourage them. And he said, and an interesting point here is you're going to be persecuted. And understand this, that the people that persecute you, they think they're doing God's word. They think they're doing God's will, but they're not. They're going to answer for it, but you just keep doing the right thing is the point. And I will be with you. And he said there in that verse number four, uh, uh, when the time comes, you will remember that I told you these things. You know, it's interesting is, as the very things that Jesus said were fulfilled, there were many things that Jesus prophesied, and if you witness their fulfillment, you're going to know that I told you these things ahead of time. And, and remembrance is is a great form of strength. And then Jesus concludes in uh, 16 verses, 16 through the end of the 
uh, basically much of the end of his teachings here, you know, he continues to encourage them and, and, and to tell them that they have hope. And, and even though they're sorrowful that he's leaving, Jesus is telling them not to, not to be sorrowful um, of those things. I am going to be with you. And he, and he makes the point there that what they were experiencing now was sorrow, but in time, their sorrow was going to be turned to joy. You read there in uh, verse number 20. Most assuredly, I say to you that you will keep weep and lament, but the world will rejoice, and you will be sorrowful, but your sorrow will be turned to joy. And he talks about a woman in, in, in labor, that she's suffering while in labor, but when she's holding that baby in her hands, that's all forgotten about. Verse 22, therefore you now have sorrow, but I will see you again, and your heart will rejoice, and, you will, and your joy no one will take from you. You will rejoice, and nobody can take that from you. Friends, You, we're going to deal with troubles in this life. The question is, what are those troubles going to do to us? They can make you weaker, or they can make you stronger. It's up to you. James 1, Romans 5, both of them emphasize the fact that trials and troubles can make you stronger if you work through them. And thus we have some things about this final teaching of Jesus. I want to conclude this lesson by, by noting uh, the, the final thing that Jesus says in John 16 and in verse number 33. These things I have spoken to you that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have trouble, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. What a source of comfort that is. So while Jesus was saying these things to his apostles, certainly there are lessons that we can learn even from this encouragement. Let's seek to apply these things in our lives, and let's strive to be everything that Jesus would have us to be. Do the words of Jesus encourage you? It is my hope that they will. And of course, when you ask that question, uh, that leads to the ultimate question, how will you respond to what he says? Will you respond to his encouragement? and become what he wants you to be. You know, that means if you're not a child of God, will you become a child of God? Or if you are a child of God and you've left him and you haven't been what you ought to be, will you come back? And is there a way that we can help you with that? We stand ready. Let me know if there's something I can do with you or for you. In the meantime, I commend the lesson to you, and if you will, uh, let us bow. Dear God and our Heavenly Father, once again, we come to you thankful for Jesus coming to this earth. We are thankful for all that he taught while he was up on this earth. And we are thankful for his message of, of encouragement to us. And we are thankful that we have the working of the Holy Spirit through your word. And we have an understanding of your will for us and what we can do to come in contact with the blood of Jesus and to live our lives faithfully and, and with a hope that goes beyond that life, this life, even though we might be living in times when the world stands against us and against you. Help us to always let our light shine. Help us to live trusting you in all that we do. We ask all of this through your son's name and amen. And as always, as always, thank you for listening to this lesson. Hopefully there is some benefit for you in the things that have been said here, that you will apply them to your lives, and that you will take courage and encouragement by the teachings of Jesus. So until next time, have a good day.